Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 114, Operation Merita, Part 2. Last time, Hitler, in order to secure the oil fields of Ploesti in southern Romania, and to pull Mussolini's chestnuts out of the fire in Greece, and to secure his southern flank from the Allies, especially with his invasion of Russia on the horizon, invaded Yugoslavia and Greece on April 6th, 1941. The well-trained and battle-hardened German troops were able to make short work of Yugoslavia's defenses. The overwhelmed country relented on April 17th. Its young king, just 17 years old, took flight and eventually ended up in London. In Greece, Hitler's Operation Merita was moving along equally well. In the Greek northeast, to the east of Macedonia, the Metexas line had fallen by April 9th. On that same day, General Maitland Wilson, commander of the BEF in Greece, had decided to withdraw from the Alakmon line in central northern Greece and pull back to the south, just north of Mount Olympus. This was mostly due to the utter disintegration of Yugoslavia's defenses in their southern theater. Now that the Germans had free range in the Strumica and Monastir sectors in the south, this would allow them to pour into Greece, to the west of the Alakmon line's end point, and attack it from behind. Less than more directly challenged. This German thrust also threatened the 12th and 20th Greek divisions holed up in Albania, currently engaged against the Italian forces there. And though Mussolini's men weren't making much progress, they were soon reinforced by the arrival of German infantry and armor. Those Greek forces, if they did not heed General Wilson's recommendation to pull back, would soon be surrounded or at the very least cut off from their allied ANZIC, Australian and New Zealand forces. Only when the New Zealanders, Australians, and a few Greeks of the Alakmon line started pulling back south, did General Papankos, commander of the 12th and 20th Greek divisions, finally relent. Those forces disengaged from the Italians on April 10th. Yet, for some inexplicable reason, the order to actually pull back did not come for two more days. Those precious 48 hours were lost. But the order to pull back was finally given. Yet the Greeks lacked wheeled transport and had the mountainous terrain to deal with. No, if they were going to get out of their current predicament, it was by foot and at night. Clearly, they needed more time, which is where McKay Force came in. Under the leadership of Ivan McKay of the 6th Australian Division, this group of Aussies, New Zealanders, Britons, and Greeks were attempting to hold off, or at least slow up, the SS Adolf Hitler Brigade, who had just taken Vevi, just on the Greek side of the Yugoslav-Greek border. The Germans spent the night of April 11th trying to dislodge those elements of McKay force in front of them, perched on the heights that commanded the road the Germans had to take to continue south. Trying to sneak up the hill during the night, if the Allies' guns could be silenced, the Germans could, when the sun rose, rush at them in relative safety. By the next morning, April 12th, the SS troops had not taken out the heavier guns, but they did manage to place themselves in between the Rangers, the 9th Battalion King's Royal Rifle Corps, and the 2nd Battalion of the 8th Australian Regiment. As it was the Rangers' job to give the 2nd Battalion room and time to deploy, and so contest the Germans' advance, the entire situation was now untenable. The Allied position fell apart, with each Commonwealth group falling back in less than perfect formation. To make matters worse for General Wilson, the SS Adolf Hitler Division was joined by the 9th Panzer Division, and being the fresher of the two, the 9th Panzer took point. Yet the semi-scattered rangers and elements of the 2nd of 8th Battalion were able to delay the 9th Panzer at Tolimes, about 25 miles south of Vevi and a bit to the east, which put the aggressors even more behind the Alakmon line. Truly, that defensive position 
was compromised. After being temporarily checked, the German force, still led by the 9th Panzer, moved more cautiously, but ever further south. By the 14th of April, the 9th, with the SS Adolf Hitler division following behind and still licking their wounds, had reached Korzani. They were now completely behind the Alekman line, about 10 miles north of Mount Olympus, and about 55 miles inland from the eastern coast. From Kozani, the Germans took the road going southeast, ever pushing the Australians in front of them, and now on a railroad were able to push harder. Yet the Aussies stayed ahead of them, crossing the Alekman River as it crisscrossed the road, heading in a southwesterly direction. But on the other side of the waterway, near Servia, were the 4th and 5th New Zealand Brigades, as well as the 16th Australian Brigade. And well dug in, they were able to repulse the 9th Panzer and the SS Adolf Hitler Division, as they charged directly at them. The Germans tried again and again to force the Anzacs back for three days. But not only was their brute force not working, the Germans were suffering heavy casualties in the process. Their mounting wounded caused their superiors to seek another way of keeping the assault going. The momentum could not be allowed to swing to the Allies. The obvious choice was a bit to the east, or on the far right flank of the Alekman line, along the coast. And in that area was the 2nd Panzer Division, which would surge south along the coast, supported by the 6th Light Infantry Mountain Division, further inland. Elements of these two units came at their part of the Alekman line on the morning of April 12th, but were refused passage by the New Zealand Divisional Cavalry. Yet the defense in front of them seemed desperate, so they tried again the next day. This time, more stealth than force was used, and the Germans managed to erect a bridgehead just downstream from where the New Zealand forces were located. And that was it for the New Zealand Divisional Cavalry. They could not hold off the Germans that had crossed over and fend off the other German elements still facing them across the way. The New Zealanders pulled back, entering the Olympus Pass, that ended at the mountain of that name. The Germans, now unhindered, stayed on their tail. This clashing race south continued for two days, until the pursuers ran into the entrenched 22nd New Zealand Battalion, which had the support of artillery. The 2nd Panzers, along with the Light Mountain Infantry Division, were held up, and then again the next day. Their casualties were not alarmingly high, but high enough for them to look around for another option. Still, the Germans were now in the Olympus Pass. Between the Allies being pushed back along the coast and further to the west, W Force's defensive position was falling apart, and the Greeks to their left were still retreating, but at a much slower pace, what with a few vehicles and dealing with the terrain. General Wilson, being logical, knew their back was all but broken. His second line of defense, the olympia servia Greneva line, was holding, for now, but it was not the new front he was hoping for. And with that mindset, Wilson, on April 13th, put the question to General Sir Thomas Blamey, the commander of the Australian forces, of pulling back to Thermopylae, a hundred miles to the south. Blamey did not want to answer the question any more than Wilson had wanted to ask it, but it was decided to put that same nagging question to General Papagos two days later. Yet the Greek general's answer shocked the two men. Papagos replied that perhaps the time had come for the Allies to consider pulling completely out of Greece. One, to save their troops, who were not going to, let's face it, save Greece and two, save the Greek people from any more devastation. This line of thought was above Wilson's pay grade, so he took the situation and everyone's thoughts to Wavell. The CNC replied with, pull back if you must, but the pullback did not have to constitute a general withdrawal. If it was still possible to oppose the Germans, then it should be done. And Wilson, 
who hated to give up, took his superior's reply and decided to pull back to Thermopylae, but to not give up the fight. Yet Wilson knew the 1st Armor Brigade would be of no help in this new phase in the war. It had been pulling back all this time, losing tanks along the way, but more due to mechanical failure than German weaponry. By the time the brigade was due east of Wilson's second line of defense, it was already down to six tanks. The unit was supposed to be filling the gap in between the new defensive line and the retreating Greeks further west, but with only six tanks left. The 1st Armor Brigade was ordered again to pull back south, and then a bit east to Kalabaka, near Trikala, which put it behind the new defensive line. The tank men could not help but notice, as they were being pulled out of the fight. Yet by the time the force arrived just west of Larissa, all of its tanks were practically useless. The western part of the plain of Thessaly was being protected by tank men without tanks. At the center of the second defensive line was the 6th New Zealand Division, but Wilson, having made up his mind, had the 6th start to pull back on April 15th. It could have gone smoothly. It should have gone smoothly. But then the weather cleared, and the Luftwaffe pounded the ground under the Anzac forces. Under this hail of bombs, elements of the 6th New Zealand tried to set up a rear guard position at Ellison, just behind the line they had left, but still north of Larissa. But to make matters worse, the RAF had to abandon their most forward bases and use two others near Athens, just over 100 miles away. The time those planes spent aloft was dramatically reduced, so the inevitable happened. The Germans were close to the airspace being challenged, could reinforce their squadrons faster, whereas the RAF had to cover a distance just to get to the fight. On April 15th, with the Allies pulling back and the Germans moving forward, the air above them was critical, but it was all a German victory. A squadron of Lemons had been wiped out in the air, and another was bombed while on the ground. The Luftwaffe dominated the skies from then on, and was taking the fight to the RAF. As Wilson had other rear guard positions established to the south and west of Larissa, they too came under fire from the skies. But it was at Larissa, or more precisely, along the coast, that Wilson's entire defensive system, if it could be called that at this point, was threatened. To the northeast of Larissa, along the coast, where the Pineos River flows into the Aegean Sea, the 21st New Zealand Battalion had just finished blowing up the tunnel there during the morning of April 15th. Seemingly, panzers were not going to be following the 21st any time soon. But as the smoke cleared, a German motorcycle battalion came at the New Zealanders, the debris not being an interference for them. But then, amazingly, the attackers managed to send their smaller tanks into the fray. Truly, the paths these machines would have to take would be dangerous for a modern day jeep. It's scarcely believable. If I can find pictures other than in the books I'm using, I'll post them on the website and on Facebook. Yet, though supported by tanks, the New Zealanders shrugged off the German motorcycle battalion, who suffered shocking casualties. Later that afternoon, a panzer regiment arrived, crossing over a quickly erected pontoon bridge, and helped renew the attack. Yet again, the Germans were thrown back, with heavy losses. But these smaller victories were not going to change the course of the battle. Gruesome as it sounds, the Germans could afford the losses. The defenders had only so many shells and bullets. The momentum was still with the Wehrmacht. The next day, April 16th, the attack was resumed, but again the New Zealanders held fast, the panzers not having their intended effect, nor their motorcycles. Yet, as the morning went on, German infantry units were able to get in close and then overrun a New Zealand company. This left the entire defensive line, sturdy up to this point, now punctured, and soon to be leaking Germans 
it was time to withdraw again. Falling back to the Pineos or Tempe Gorge, just to the northeast of Larissa, the Anzacs fell back. Yet the Germans, though dealing with many casualties, stayed with the fleeing forces. Just after the defenders crossed the bridge over the Pineos River, it was blown. But the Germans, putting faith in their machines, drove their panzers into the river. Some made it across, some sank down into holes, the men quickly climbing out as their machines filled with water. And though delayed by the crossing, the German advance continued south, near the coast. As the Aussies and New Zealanders raced south, the Germans right behind them, both sides threw in more men. General Blamey, commander of the Australian forces, called up the 16th Australian Brigade, the Germans the 6th Light Infantry Mountain Division. During this running battle, some of the tanks of the 2nd Panzer Division managed to race ahead of many of the Anzac forces. The gorge was fast becoming a German trap. Now cut off were the 21st New Zealand Brigade and the 2nd Australian Brigade. In order to remain uncaptured, the men from both units ran for the hills of Mount Osa. During the next few days, many of them managed, as individuals or in small groups, to make their way south. But as a fighting force, their Greek campaign was over. Keep in mind, these brigades were to be the blocking force that kept the attackers from racing down the road to Larissa and capturing even more Anzac forces. Yet, winging it as best they could, other Allied forces were put on the road north of Larissa, and the Germans were held up yet again. And on April 17th, with everyone on both sides knowing this ad hoc blocking force could only hold out for so long, what with Luftwaffe bombs raining down on them, artillery shells finding their range, and panzers getting as close as they could to add their might to the storm. The remnants of the disarmed 1st Armor Brigade passed through Larissa and continued south, followed by the other major force led by Brigadier Savage. The next day, April 18th, it was time to gamble. As the 6th New Zealand Brigade, now the only force still north of Larissa, was ordered to, somehow, pull back from the teeth of the Panzers. Incredibly, they accomplished this, and as the sun went down, they too passed through Larissa. The 6th constituted the only organized force remaining near the Germans. But assuredly, there were pockets of Australians and New Zealanders still north of the town. They would have to make do. But many would not make do and end up as prisoners of Nazi Germany. Checking the Germans from, as before, following hard upon the retreating Anzac force, was extensive demolitions of roads and tunnels. It wasn't as if the Germans could simply go around the mess. The terrain did not permit that. And by April 19th, General Wilson was able to report to his CNC that the majority of W Force, in whatever various states, had reached Thermopylae. It was another successful retreat, or if looked at another way, another German victory. And it was about to get worse. General Papagos was still adamant about the Allied forces leaving Greece altogether. Her future would be determined by Germany. The ancient philosophers said that true happiness comes from within. Well, obviously, they never played Best Fiends. This free-to-download game has it all. Fun characters, new challenges, and thousands of puzzles to play. Whenever I have a few minutes, I bring it up, and I carry on with my quest to get to level 1000 before my wife does. The competition in our house is fierce, more fiendish, and bragging rights are everything. I'm currently on level 87, so I have a ways to go, but that's part of the fun. The gathering of cute characters is my fave by far. I love the artwork. And you can play Best Fiends without an internet connection once you download it. And know that every win brings new challenges and new in-game events are added all the time. So let enough is never enough be your mantra. 
Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Epilogue. Too small to succeed. To give a better idea of why the Allies had no chance of winning in Greece, the 1st Armor Brigade, or rather, the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment of it, can be used as a microcosm to show how outmatched the Allies were. When the 1st Armor Brigade came to the Middle East in early 1941, it was, at the time, a part of the 2nd Armored Division. Its main punching power was the 3rd Royal Tanks, which had been issued brand new A-13 cruiser tanks to go along with its older A-10 tanks. But when word came that they were going to Greece, its two squadrons of new A-13 tanks were being pulled out and replaced by two of the A-10s, a slower, weaker model. And the state of their tank tracks was an immediate concern. Nevertheless, they were soon en route to Greece, and then by train to Larissa. Along the way, the personnel of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment howled for spare parts and spare tracks, knowing theirs were not long for this world. Eventually, they got spare tracks for another kind of tank. And their spare parts finally came, just as they were pulling out of Larissa. So, no help there. When the SS Adolf Hitler Division was coming south, the 3rd Royal Tank got the call on April 11th. C Squadron was ordered to head north and station themselves at Kella, in case the Germans came that way. But as the tanks moved out, one broke down due to a damaged distributor. Another six broke down due to their tracks. The tanks were quickly repaired and on their way, but that was it for the spare parts they had with them. A few days later, C Squadron got the word to return to base, as the Germans had gone another way. Yet that journey back finished off five pairs of tracks and two other tanks' pistons. The seven tanks were set ablaze and abandoned. One more tank had to be put out of its misery the next day due to damaged track pins. Soon after, the Germans really did come their way, and C Squadron gave battle, holding out for a few hours, mainly thanks to the support of their artillery. Yet word soon came, it was time to go. B Squadron set out first, but quickly lost six tanks due to track failure. Another tank had to be destroyed due to damage taken. C Squadron went next, but lost three more tanks to ruined tracks, and a fourth due to steering issues. Again, it has to be said, normal spare parts could have kept most of these machines going. These mechanical failures left the job of covering their retreat to A Squadron, which managed to take out four German tanks as they exited. But A Squadron couldn't hold up the Germans alone, and were ordered to follow the others. But as they headed out, two of their tanks were lost by track trouble and two more by other mechanical failures. As the Germans stayed on their tail, nine troop of C Squadron was set upon, but managed to hit two German tanks. It was then the squadron commander's tank gave up the ghost to, yes, track failure. So throwing as much gear as they could onto their final tank, they set out, only to stop. The tank's fuel pump was ruined. The men of C Squadron got a ride, from B Squadron. By the time B Squadron rejoined the regiment near the Alakmon River, another eight tanks were left behind. This left B Squadron with one tank and C Squadron with two tanks overall. It was decided to join the two tanks of C Squadron to the nine remaining tanks of A Squadron, but as the retreat continued, more tanks were lost due to mechanical failure. Thus, on the morning of April 15th, the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, having only six tanks left, and they were not 100%, were pulled out of the line. Yet, in trying to head south, not under combat conditions, they lost more tanks anyway. Two tanks gave out the first day, and three more on the second. And on April 17th, the very last tank of 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, fittingly, lost its tracks.
But before repairs of any kind could be contemplated, a German plane swung low and put the machine out of its misery. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So just want to say hi to my new members. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Michael B. from Winnipeg in Canada. He not only bought a Churchill mug, he made a donation. So, Michael, thank you very much for that. As far as uh, thanking other people who have donated, uh, I'd like to thank Stephen T. from London in the U.K., Peter H. from Ottawa, Ontario, and I can't forget Pebbles from Bartlett. Thank you, Pebbles. And also James B. A big thank you to James B. He sent me some cigars. It's always a good way to get on my Christmas card list. Uh, as far as my new members, I just want to say hello and thank you for supporting the show. To Paul B. from Midsummer Norton in the UK. Jesus A. from Mill City, Oregon. Chris S. from New Orleans, Louisiana. Penny L. from Bedfordshire in the UK. Peter B. from Melbourne, Australia. Allison S. from Wellington, New Zealand. Good for you, New Zealand. Uh, Peter R. from Lake Oswego, Oregon. Lars S. from Trondheim, Norway. Brent M. I'm sorry, Brent, it didn't say where you were from, so I apologize for that. And Isaac M. from El Dorado, Kansas. So thank you all very much. I really do appreciate it. For those of you who are thinking about membership, there are, what, 43 episodes now. We finished up kind of what the story of what happened to the Jews in Warsaw, and now we're covering uh, British Special Forces behind Rommel's line, Rommel's line in North Africa. So if you're thinking about membership or if you want to give it as a gift for someone, you can just go to worldwar2podcast.net and, and sign up there, and you can put their email address in instead of yours, and the password and the username will, will get sent to them. Just putting that out there. So I will see you as soon as I can in the next, I'm hoping next five days, with the, the next part of the Greek story. Take care, everyone.